There are steppes, semi-deserts, dazzling desert sands, swamps, rapid rivers, and even the most southern subtropical forest of Russia here in Dagestan. But in order to get there, into that thick impenetrable forest, in the realm of lianas and orchids, we'll have to pass through the vast steppe, a quicksand, climb over the mountains, and the most exciting thing about it is that all this is located within one of our country's regions. This is what diverse Dagestan is like. You can see the real geographical wonder, which is the Sardakum sand dune. It is located within Dagestan National Reserve, and it has several indisputable records. Look, a lake. Sitting here on the Sardakum sand dune, one can use the word the most to it all the time. Yes, this sand dune itself is the highest one in Eurasia. Yes, it is the most unique and matchless one. But what about the species of flora and fauna? There should also be some takes the cake here? I guess so. Particularly here you can find the most poisonous and the largest poisonous snake of our country, which is called the blunt nose viper. Is this the only place, actually, where it can be found in Russia? Yes, this part of Dagestan is the only part of Russia where this snake can be found. And here is a blunt nose viper. I would say that in terms of this snake, it would be safe to use the word the most. First, as you've already heard, it is the largest and most poisonous snake among the other snakes of our country. Second, it is the largest viper in the world. And it is a snake of the viper kind. By the way, its second name is Levantine Viper. And I would add for myself that this snake is the most even tempered snake among the poisonous ones. Look, a black vulture has taken off the top of the sand dunes, and this is the largest bird of Russia. And at the foot of this sand dune, we were constantly coming across glass snakes. And it's safe to call them the largest legless lizards, among others. I am afraid that if it carries on like this, then I will have to use titles everywhere on my entire way to the most southern and perhaps the most unusual forest of our homeland. Well, by the way, this hole is inhabitable. Well, let's perform this surgical operation so that we don't do it any harm. Oh, honey. Here you are. Well, let's see. Come here, lady, frog princess. What kind of toad is this? A green one? Yes, it is a green toad. Bufo veridis, right? That's exactly right. This is a bufo veridis. Look, what a beautiful toad it is. Why is there such a detestation of toads? They are remarkably nice. I don't know. I think that toads are generally attractive animals. Calm ones. Yes. And what eyes they have. Golden. They are beautiful. Constellations. Some kind of galaxies are shining in this wide toad's eyes. Yes, it is true that these animals are beautiful. These are nocturnal animals. Yes, they are active only at night. Of course, they are hiding in wet shelters in such hot weather. Okay, Oleg. After all, toads won't leave any marks on our hands. There are no warts on our hands. No, this is complete rubbish. Warts are actually caused by a viral disease. Okay. And toads are not carriers of this virus. As a majority of amphibians, they release a very heavy and biologically active secrete on their skin surface. They have poisonous glands called parotids. Here they are. Okay. Are these the glands they use to release the poison? Yes, I think we can even squash them and we'll... Bufotoxin. Yes, get some amount of bufotoxin. Well, again, it is something that won't hurt us. Here it is. Yeah, here it is. We have moisture released. Yes. In other words, if some kind of predator will snatch this toad, he will spit it out with disgust, right? Well, more likely. Though, for instance, well, they don't live here. Though the green toad is one of the common animals of the Eurasian continent. But one can apply the title to her. 
it's hard to find the right way of expressing it. This is the most drought-resistant toad of Russia. This is the only amphibian that can survive in hot desert sands where there is no precipitation for months. And this is a very rare thing in the world of botany that we have found in the Piedmont, not far from the sand dunes. No, there are those irises that are still blossoming. I was afraid that we were late because everywhere there were only seed buds, but it is still possible to find a few flowers. This is the rarest plant in Russia, and this is not a simple iris, this is a sharp-lobed iris. It belongs to the Oncocyclus section. This is the extreme point of its range. Generally, it can be found in the Transcaucasian region, in Armenia and Azerbaijan. On the territory of Russia, it cannot be found anywhere except in Dagestan. But what is interesting, that oncocycluses are plants that are vegetating in winter. This is exactly in winter, when they have green leaves, when they are growing in southern mountainsides. And then in summer, the leaves are fading and only dry blades are left that will be blown away by the wind. But in autumn, fresh leaves will appear again and the plant will start to blossom. This is what a short happiness of beauty is like. There are more than 800 species in the genus Iris. They can be found on all continents, of course, except Antarctica. But why is this iris called sharp-lobed? What kind of lobes are these that are sharp? The thing is that six petals of its floret are not petals at all, but perianth lobes. Three outer lobes are bent down and three upper ones that are sharp stretch over them. The uniqueness of this nature-made object is evident. This is the most northern sharp-lobed iris. But generally, this exact plant species has the narrowest range in Russia. And, by the way, irises were named after the Greek goddess Iris. She was the goddess of the rainbow. This iris has a wonderful coloring. Just have a look. There are no bright colors. There are only elegant, delicate lines. I've had a few more wonderful meetings here in the Piedmont. But let's start with the beginning. The blue rock thrush is definitely the rarest kind of thrush among the other species of our homeland. It is a very shy, wild, and bright-colored bird. They often use to cage these beautiful singing birds in Europe. So, more likely, this species of thrush served as a prototype of the blue bird of happiness from Meiterlink's fairy tale. And Painted Lady is definitely the bravest and the most inexhaustible traveler that can be called as a migratory butterfly. In autumn, Painted Ladies fly south to stay there for the winter and come back here in the spring to lay their eggs and propagate new generations of their Lepidopterus genus. Poppy. You can hardly find any other plant that would be related to so many legends and tales. The ancient people already knew not only about its great healing power, but about its cunning. More than 30,000 seeds can ripen in one poppy capsule. Ancient Greeks would hardly bother with counting the number of poppy seeds, but this plant was the symbol of great fertility for them. This is why its flowers and seeds were always used in wedding rites. Ancient Egyptians learned how to make hypnotic remedies using poppy and the emperor Carolus Magnus had such a strong belief in the healing power of the poppy plant that by a separate decree ordered his subjects to cultivate poppies near every house, no matter what kind of dwelling it was, whether it was a palace or a poor peasant's house. I can hardly define what kind of category, what kind of records poppies can be related to, but you should agree that a blossoming poppy field is the most unforgettable sight. Here we see a Mediterranean spur-thighed tortoise. Yes, this is such an irony. The nearest sea is the Caspian Sea, and this species is named after the far Mediterranean Sea. Well, what a man can do if it is the first place where this species has been described for the first time. Mediterranean spur-thighed tortoises can be called the most northern ones along with its Central Asian cousin. A lot of misconceptions and myths are related to this tortoise like their longevity. Of course, these tortoises don't live for hundreds of years, 
and they don't have the ability to starve for years. Well, tortoises can live without food and water for a longer period of time than other more active animals, but not for years still. Well, now let's trial up the shyest recesses, as it is there where you can often find something interesting. Each forsaken house is always a lottery for naturalists, but I am sure that we'll find some guests of this house. And here you are. Here are the guests of this house. Can you see them? There is a small bat colony. Now we'll find out who they are. Well, well, well. There are some more. Well, let's make it clear right now. The word bat is an absolutely wrong name. Bats are called flying mice in Russian. Because these nice small animals belong to the order of Chiroptera. And after all, they are closer to us, apes, than to rodents on the taxonomy basis. Though there are some different theories of their origin. Some scientists think that these animals have originated from some insect eaters. And others think that this branch of animals originated from some ancient apes. Well, it would be more correct to call them flying monkeys. Look, when a bat is having a rest, it folds its body with its leather wing membranes and looks like a flower bud or some kind of black tulip. Can you see that? And now, it's time when it's possible to define what kind of species these bats belong to. This is a lesser horseshoe-nosed bat. And if you look at its muzzle, then you'll understand why it has been given such a name, a horseshoe-nosed bat. And it's called a lesser one because there's also a greater horseshoe-nosed bat that is a bit larger than this one. In general, there are nearly 70 species of horseshoe bats, but these ones are the smallest ones out of the entire genus. How can I avoid using some more epithets? The liveliest, the most attractive bat among other species of bats found within our homeland. And this bat is probably not the rarest one, but still very rare. It is listed in the International Red Data Book. Another miniature creation of nature has been waiting for us outside. Ouch! Wait, 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 wait! Look at how small but brave this snake is. Well, show me! Fight like a man! Well, this is a baby whip snake. Well, it has still got a juvenile coloration. Can you see the spots it has on its olive body? And when it grows up, it will turn into a big snake. Well, the biggest one in our homeland. These whip snakes can be two meters long. But I think that this snake can be called the bravest one in our country because even this tiny snake defends itself desperately. The large whip snake or Caspian whip snake is the largest snake in Europe. It has a length of more than two meters. So this tiny snake will grow like his large relatives and its coloration will change drastically. Its body pattern will disappear. Its back will be shot with a metal glow and have well-traced scales, and its belly will turn yellow. A grown-up whip snake is brave and even aggressive, but a baby whip snake has to hide from predators. Look, what good camouflage! If it rolls itself into a ball while lying on a stone covered with lichen, you will go past this snake without noticing it. But even such a baby can hunt for little lizards. It is very dexterous, fast, and vehement. Well, we've only crossed the sands and foothills so far. And how many things shall we meet in the steppe? In the reeds near the Precaspian rivers. And only now I start to realize that nearly every animal in these surroundings is a flake. Every species of wildlife here is unique in its own way. And the word, the most, can be attributed to practically every creation of nature. Well. We have almost reached the southern point of our country. Let's see what we meet on our way that will take the cake. It is the depth of spring. The steppe will stay green to the lamb's delight for another month. But here is an interesting thing. Not only hoofed animals are grazing on the fresh grass, but a lot of bird species as well. Oh, even cranes. Here you see demoiselle cranes. Judging by the name of this species, these cranes can be called the most beautiful among other cranes. But this is a matter of taste. 
as they have fitting rivals in the crane family. But demoiselle cranes can definitely be called the smallest ones among the other cranes. They are actually grazing, eating tender small roots, sprouts, but if they find some small living creatures, they won't be squeamish about eating them. That's why Polyphaga aegyptica should be very careful. I don't know what honorable things about it can be mentioned. Well, it's probably the largest cockroach among native ones, and the northern border of its range lies here in Dagestan. And here is a highly awarded prize winner in many different categories. Well, frankly speaking, it doesn't belong to the animal kingdom, but the plant one. This Spartan of saline steppes has different names, tamarix, tamarisk. Well, in general, this is a simple, inconspicuous plant. But when tamarisk thicket is blossoming, then the entire steppe looks like it is floating in pink clouds. Tamarisk is a true Koshi the Immortal of the plant kingdom. It can stand 40 degree frosts, the burning heat of the steppes. It can stay underwater for two months during the spring floods and grow in saline soil. Here is another takes the cake. We've come to the steppe boundary. We are approaching our destination point. Who shall we meet on our way? There are no record-breaking creatures so far. What can be so exciting about a thoughtful tessellated water snake? It is a common wetland snake. The buzzard is the most common bird of prey in our country. But it would be safe to call stilt a record breaker. It is a bird with the longest legs among others. Well, relative to its body, of course. In other words, cranes have longer legs, but they are much larger than stilts. We have found a big pelican colony in the Agrican Bay. This is a Dalmatian pelican, which is the largest bird in its family. And, by the way, this is the only bird that can compete with wandering albatross in terms of wingspan. Its wingspan is more than three meters. Well, probably pelicans can be called the most skillful collective fishing birds because there are very few bird species that can act as one like they do. Well, one would think, what can be exciting in the most ordinary crow? Well, first and foremost is that this bird is the smartest one among other birds. It is proven that crows can count and use ambient objects to reach certain goals. Though, there are the most ordinary gray crows found in Dagestan. Well, here we are in the southernmost forest of Russia. And here we can find a very peculiar kind of orchid, Listera, that can be presented as the most cunning temptress. It uses its flowers that remarkably resemble female insects to attract pollinating insects. See, there is a belly, a cephalothorax, two wings, and even two protruding antennae. A lonely male insect is flying and flying and then he sees this tempting female insect that has a round belly, appealingly spread wings and even antennae. But it will be too late when the deception is exposed because the male insect has already got smeared with pollen and will fly further to pollinate other glisteras. There is a great variety of orchids of different kinds in the southernmost forest of our country but I would probably make you surprised with such an epithet. Here is the most obscene orchid among others that is called the monkey orchid. But why monkey? Get a look at its inflorescence. Can you see it now? Each flower looks like a miniature human or monkey. There are small arms, legs, body, head, and the most exciting thing is that there are two small eyes on the face and a smiling mouth. It looks exactly like a smiling face emoji. What a striking resemblance! Well, why have I called it the obscene orchid? Well, under higher-powered magnification, 
You'll notice right at once that all monkeys on these flowers are only male ones. But now it's time to find the mightiest tree of the southernmost forest of our country. Chinars are the patriarchs of these local forests. Now we'll try to measure the diameter of this giant. Plane trees, or chinars, appeared here long time ago, in the times of the Arabic Wars. That was in the time period between the 10th and 12th century. There is an interesting question. Why do people in the East like to gather under plane trees when it's hot? Well, first, because there is shade, of course, and it's cool under it. But the most important reason for that is that chinars are releasing an abundant amount of substances that repel insects. That's why nothing disturbs the distinguished audience sitting under these trees. Well, its diameter is a little less than 14 meters. Well, we should subtract 2 meters for the root shoots, and after that, we get a 12-meter tree trunk. This chinar has got a 4-meter diameter. But I should admit that such a diameter is far from being the largest one for these trees. Chinar of plane tree is one of the most valuable wood species. It is used for the production of furniture, high-end parquet. It has such a delicate aroma that it is even used for the production of different perfumes and toilet water. And these are not cigarette butts that are called chinareks, but the fruits of chinar. Here you see such nice-looking hanging hedgehogs. Each hedgehog contains small seeds that squirrels, birds, and even wild hogs like to eat so much. Chinars can be so big that once a tea room was made in the hollow of a chinar trunk. This place is not far away from here, in Azerbaijan. Well, the height of that giant is 24 meters. No, I haven't measured myself. I was told so. Samursky Forest in Dagestan is unique because of its abundance and variety of liana species. Sometimes they run so wild that it's hard to see what a supporting tree under them looks like. And I will remind you of the fact that lianas are such plants that cannot grow by themselves. As soon as a long whip finds a support and attaches to it, it will become a liana right after that. So, liana is only a form which is typical for plants of practically every plant family, whether these are legumes, orchids, or milkweed plants. There are even Lenoi cacti. Such a shape has plenty of advantages. First, a plant needs only a small area to take roots in a thick forest. Second, it is easier to use a trunk of another tree to climb up on top where there is so much light. And third, it makes it possible for a plant to have a sufficient amount of green basis while saving so much energy. It would probably be safe to call Simorsky Forest in Dagestan the richest one in the number of lianas or the most leonoid forest of the European part of Russia, as only the Far Eastern flora representatives can compete with it in the Asian part of our country. At the end of our expedition, I will use the epithet the most that I have repeated so often for the last time. We are in the city that is, as some scientists say, 2,000 years old. Others say that it is 3,000 years old. And the third group, the third ones say that settlements appeared in this area 5,000 years ago. Durbent is the most ancient city of Russia, the southern advanced stronghold of our homeland.